connections. A great deal of imagination is required to make many helicopter installations work. It is better if one antenna is installed on the top and a low clearance bent back comm antenna installed on the bottom. In some cases, boom installations may have to be done. A boom mount too far forward may cause fuselage blockage. Installations like this may cause VHF comm interference with VOR. There are problems enough on helicopters with rotor modulation. Care should be taken to assure VOR and comm antennas are as far apart as possible. Fabric-covered aircraft present their own unique problems with insufficient ground plane for proper system operation. For example, proper internal considerations must be made with wire screening or sheet metal 24 inches square to act as a VHF ground plane. Low fuselage aircraft present difficult installation problems because of insufficient ground clearance. This installation is mounted too high on the side of the fuselage, causing poor reception from the left side of the aircraft. It is recommended that the antenna be mounted lower on the fuselage. Many aircraft use the standard factory antenna installation package, which works well for many installations. Once again, the higher power transceivers used in conjunction with combination VOR and COM antennas may not provide enough isolation to prevent serious interference from one system to the other. Here, the forward antenna is too far aft and should be placed farther forward for more inter-system isolation, or one antenna should go on the bottom. With today's higher power transmitters and extremely sensitive receivers, an installation that worked with older radios may not work now. If problems suddenly develop with a new package installation, crowded antenna locations may be the cause. Calm antennas, in many cases, are located too close to the emergency locator transmitter antenna. Once again, space on the aircraft is critical. Now, when it comes to the emergency locator transmitter, that's that little, this little whip. You're not really going to turn that on until when? Till you know you're going to crash. Okay, so even if you were using the COM system on 121.5, uh, you know it won't interfere with the. Uh, sorry, the ELT won't interfere with the COM because you haven't turned it on yet. Okay. Like I said, when it comes to the ELT, sure, I know some of the ELTs have a, you know, a, a, an omnidirectional G switch, or a, just a G switch, um, but I'm not going to rely on that G switch to, to turn the ELT on when I'm uh, when I'm crashing. I'm going to turn it on from the remote cockpit switch, but I'm just going to turn it on at the very end after I've told folks on the comm that that we're going in. Okay. But what they're worried about is crosstalk. You're going you're gonna to hear the, the ELT through the comm system if you're on 121.5, but that's going to happen anyways. doesn't matter how far you put that antenna away. Antennas should not be mounted in close proximity unless absolutely necessary. With the ELT antenna, reflections can occur, causing one system to talk to the other. Also, it is recommended that the emergency locator transmitter antenna be installed on the top far aft on the aircraft and not on the bottom. This antenna would surely be damaged in any accident, rendering the ELT useless. Radio telephones operate in the UHF band from 450 to 500 megahertz. Radio telephone antennas generally are installed on the belly to prevent shadowing and provide maximum range. Many systems are full duplex, both transmitting and receiving at the same time using the same antenna. In some installations, when the antenna is located near movable skin surfaces or loose joints, the loose joints produce noise in the receiver when the transmitter is operating. The problem isn't obvious on the ground unless vibration is introduced to the movable surface. To localize the problem, thump the skin with your hand moving the control surface, listening for the noise in the receiver. An engine run-up may help by introducing more vibration. The transmitter must be operating for the noise to be generated. There's found have been elevators, trim tab hinges, and loose inspection plates. 
Relocation of the antenna is usually the only permanent solution, as most bonding techniques are ineffective at these UHF frequencies. Internal rubbing or vibrating metal-to-metal -metal contacts have also caused noise, like an unused antenna connector rattling against the skin in the belly. This type of installation leaves a lot to be desired. Due to its closeness to the dorsal fin, which acts as a reflector, transmission and reception are compromised on the dorsal fin side. Navigation systems using ground transmitting sites allow the aircraft to determine its position in space in reference to the ground station. Performance and accuracy of these systems is vitally important. The aircraft VOR systems start with antenna designs using the half-wave V-type antenna or the balanced loop antenna. The difference between the two is basically the radiation pattern characteristics. The V-type antenna has a figure eight azimuth pattern showing good fore and aft sensitivity. The balanced loop antennas have a circular azimuth pattern offering equal sensitivity from any direction. V-type antennas are mounted in the vertical stabilizer with the elements pointing forward or pointing aft. Lately, most of these installations use the aft pointing configuration because it is less likely to break under icing conditions. The V-type dipole may be integrated with a mast that can also contain a comm antenna for an over-the-cabin installation. Some mast Vs do not have a VHF comm antenna. For the most part, V antennas are quite satisfactory for most VOR operations. In the past, most of the VORs were very forgiving. That is, receivers weren't as sensitive, and we weren't demanding as much from the radios. Since the state of the art in radios has virtually made quantum advances, they can now be considered more discriminating and less forgiving. Balanced loop antennas come in the standard open loop type used on many single or twin engine aircraft with the typical vertical stabilizer installation, or the blade type is used on higher performance aircraft and on up through jets. Another type of VOR antenna is the flesh type generally used on commercial jets. For our program, we will not touch on flush VOR antennas. Balanced loop antennas have been around for over 25 years and do not solve all of today's problems, but their design overcomes many of the deficiencies of the V antenna for today's systems, particularly area navigation installations. The popularity of area navigation, or RNAV, continues to increase. Flying from VOR to VOR is being rapidly replaced by more clear direct flight plans. The V-type VOR antenna is adequate for most VOR to VOR flying because the station is generally within the figure eight sensitivity pattern of the antenna. Area navigation, however, frequently places you at right angles to the station and in the null of a V-type antenna, which limits the effectiveness of the RNAV due to loss of signal. Towel bar or blade antennas have a more circular pattern and give more consistent results. VOR antenna installations and placement on most aircraft are predicated on tried and true methods. Helicopters usually present antenna placement problems due to lack of usable skin surface. Installations of V-type antennas on top of the cabin or under the fuselage have proven adequate in many cases. Another proven type of installation utilizes balanced loop towel bars or blades on the fuselage or boom locations with excellent dependable results. V-tailed Bonanza's installation problems have been worked out by using either balanced loop towel bars or blades on either side of the aft fuselage under the stabilators. This type of installation has proven itself to be reliable and will provide excellent system performance. Transponder and DME antennas are treated as equals because they operate in the same frequency range from 962 to 1213 megahertz. The transponder and DME actually share some of the same frequencies, so obviously their placement relative to each other is important. At these higher frequencies, the margin for installation error is greatly reduced. 
However, antenna placement, coax selection, connector assembly, and antenna grounding are critical factors. L-band antennas come in two basic varieties, the blade and the spike. The spike antenna has the advantages of lower cost and easier operation. However, several disadvantages have led most equipment manufacturers to abandon the spike antenna. The spike antenna is very susceptible to mechanical damage. They are often bent or the end wall is knocked off. When either happens, the VSWR goes up dramatically. L-band antennas are usually designed to have low VSWR at the transponder transmitter frequency of 1090 megahertz. The transponder transmitter cavity is very susceptible to VSWR. A high VSWR antenna will pull the transponder frequency out of spec, requiring the cavity to be retuned in the aircraft. A transponder requiring major retuning in the aircraft, compared to the bench test set, usually signals a defective antenna or coax. The other disadvantage of a spike antenna is its dirt and grease susceptibility. Dirt and grease on the spike antenna deteriorates the performance of the system. Because this buildup is usually gradual, the pilot sees it as a gradual range reduction and assumes the DME to be weakening. Often, the performance can be restored by simply cleaning off the contaminants with the mild solvent. Pay particular attention to cleaning the insulator at the base of the antenna. That's where grease and dirt cause the high losses. A blade-type antenna, on the other hand, usually has the active element embedded in plastic, and dirt and oil are not as damaging to performance because contaminants are farther from the active element. It is still a good policy to keep the antennas clean. It is recommended that DME transponder antennas be placed farther than two feet from each other and at least two feet away from the marker beacon or ADF antennas. Proper performance is going to be determined by the antenna placement. This installation shows good separation of DME to transponders and COM. This type of installation is good while airborne, but when the nose gear is down, performance will be affected. Separation from the marker beacon on the right is good. This blade antenna was mounted in a poor location, behind the exhaust stack. High heat and hydrocarbon contaminants will gradually deteriorate performance. Locating an antenna close to a ventral fin causes severe shadowing on the right side of the aircraft and can pull the transponder off frequency. This sense antenna standoff is a parasitic element of the DME installation affecting the radiation pattern. A strong possibility of ADF interference also exists. DME transponder antennas should be installed close to the center line of the aircraft. In some cases, antennas are installed at an angle like this. However, they should not be installed where the angle of the antenna from the vertical exceeds 15 degrees. Otherwise, severe blockage will occur on the other side of the aircraft. Installation of L-band blades this close together causes interaction and is definitely not recommended. Proper coaxial cable selection becomes more important as the frequency increases. Attenuation is a larger factor in the system performance above 1,000 megahertz. A few tenths of a dB at VHF isn't of much concern. At L-band, the difference is significant and affects the system performance. The transponder TSO requires that the loss in the coax be no more than 2 dB. That is why the technical manuals call out coax length maximums. Suppose you install a 250-watt transponder with 10 feet of RG58 coax to the antenna. You've thrown away over 37% of the transmitter power on coax. And that's not all. You've also removed 2 dB of receiver sensitivity permanently. If the same installation was done with RG8, 208 watts would be delivered to the antenna with only 17% lost in the coax. Tube type RF output cavities are the main life mechanism in transponders. These tubes die gradually with time. If you make a marginal coax installation using RG58, 
Your customer won't notice it initially because the transmitter power is sufficient. If a 2 dB loss occurs in the cable, the output power at the antenna end is reduced to 63%. In time, your customer will reach the marginal output level much sooner than he would with a 1 dB coax loss. Over the life of the installation, this could cost the owner dearly just because you found it easier to run RG58 than RG8. You'd be doing the customer a big favor by charging him that little extra for better coax and connectors. Explain why, and you'll soon look like a hero. Glide slope systems utilize many different types of antennas. The classic type is the over-cabin half-wave V-type. This type of antenna provides a reliable signal input into the receiver. Variations of this type include windshield antennas on single-engine aircraft right above the sun visors or attached to the inside of the ray dome of twin-engine aircraft. Placements can be made on the top or bottom of the aircraft. However, care should be taken to assure there is no RF blockage. For instance, when the glide slope system is being used and the nose gear is down, this type of installation will cause serious blockage. Another type is the loop glide slope antenna, which may be used on single or twin engine aircraft mounted externally or inside a ray dome. This type of antenna is less susceptible to prop modulation problems that can be experienced on V-types. Dual separation can be obtained by using a coupler. This is generally done by using the dual VOR single glide slope coupler, commonly called a triplexer. The triplexer will feed two VOR receivers as well as a glide slope receiver. This is accomplished because the glide slope frequency band is within the third harmonic of the VOR frequency. Usually, this means compatibility. However, not every installation is satisfactory because of VOR antenna location and its geometric relationship to the aircraft approach characteristics. There may be wing or fuselage blockage. Consequently, systems operation must be verified by a flight test. Marker beacon systems are fairly straightforward with standard antennas and placement generally on centerline keel installations. The common type of marker beacon antenna is the sled type bent wire with final tuning achieved mechanically by sliding and locking the connector clip when maximum transfer of energy is attained at the receiver. These antennas work very well, but their basic limitation is that they are susceptible to damage on the ground and icing breakage. They also detune easily when dirty. However, they can be cleaned and retuned as on initial installation. More and more installations are using low-profile boat-type antennas. There are two basic types, tunable and non-tunable. The tunable types require final tuning on the aircraft. As time goes by, it may have to be retuned. The non-retunable type uses a fixed-tuned element that holds its frequency very reliably. Because of operating requirements, certain aircraft require special installations. For example, amphibian installations present problems. A keel installation would compromise the watertight hull. Underwing placement can work very satisfactorily. Present-day NAVCOM installations are dual systems, and generally, two marker beacon receivers can be driven by a single antenna by using a dual output coupler. An isolated coupler will provide proper signal to the two receivers. Much has happened to ADF technology and its antennas since the days of the solid whip since antenna. Although these are quite workable, the newer one-piece combination loop and sense antennas offer much, both to the user and the installing agency. The older type antenna is the long wire, which usually exits atop the cockpit and anchors at the rudder cap. It can also be installed on the belly of the aircraft, supported by a mast on each end. When the sense antenna is installed, special care must be taken in its placement so as not to pick up transponder interference. Interference is generally picked up by the vertical lead-in section of the sense antenna and not the horizontal long wire. 
Ideally, in a new installation, it is better to place the sense and loop antennas first, then place the pulse antennas in a good location for pulse equipment operation, but one that will not interfere with the ADF. Whether a top or bottom sense antenna is used, remember that it should be 50 picofarads in capacitance. In this top-mounted sense antenna, an insulator partway up the line limits the length of the sense antenna, and therefore its capacitance. Refer to the manufacturer's manual to calculate the correct length of line to match the 50 puff requirement. When installing a long wire sense antenna, use poly-covered antenna wire to reduce the effects of P-static on the ADF system. When mounting the loop antenna, Ensure that the loop is as close as possible to the electrical center of the sense antenna. Otherwise, the ADF indicator needle in the cockpit will swing too early or too late at station passage, depending on whether the loop is forward of or behind the electrical center of the sense antenna. It should also be noted that the ADF antenna cables should be routed away from any AC or high current carrying wires in the aircraft. Unlike this example, be sure to use all the necessary parts. Note that the insulator cap was not put on when the lead-in was soldered to the skin feed-through. This kind of mistake can allow early corrosion damage at the solder point and possible antenna breakage in snow or ice due to lack of wire support. The majority of the problems just mentioned are solved by using the one-piece sense and loop antenna offered by most ADF equipment manufacturers. One final point to remember. During installation of either type antenna system, check for the proper loop quadrantal error correction per the manufacturer's manual. This will ensure the accuracy that the system was designed to give. HF communications, due to long wavelength, bring very special antenna problems that must be taken into consideration before installation. Many questions arise. Should it be long wire fixed? Long wire trailing or short wire? Should it be end fed or center fed? Should it be grounded or ungrounded? HF antenna configurations come in many varieties. This somewhat short long wire antenna extends from the wing tip to the top of the stabilizer and then down to the feed point on the fuselage. This heavy probe type HF antenna on the rudder top is fed by a coupler directly below the probe. The coupler allows the probe to look electrically like an antenna from 8 to 80 feet long, depending on the frequency selected. Here is one type of short wire antenna used on smaller jet aircraft. It is fed from a coupler just inside the fuselage exit point and can be left open or grounded depending on the coupler used. Here is the same type of aircraft with a similar type antenna, but it is grounded as can be noted by the small loop of wire at the top of the rudder. This is an example of a grounded type antenna on a turboprop aircraft. Again, note the grounding loop at the rudder top. The voltage-fed ungrounded antenna exits at the forward cabin area and attaches to the rudder using an insulator. This installation is more typical of ungrounded HF antennas. In an attempt to get more usable antenna line outside the aircraft, this installation has a Wyndham T type antenna. The Wyndham T is unbalanced, offset fed, and insulated at both ends. This less conventional antenna is used to increase the effective electrical length. Another type of antenna is a shunt or current fed antenna. Sufficient length for a long wire voltage fed antenna cannot be installed effectively on this type of aircraft. With the shunt fed antenna, the aircraft is the radiator. The coupler unit, which is inside the pressure vessel, passes its energy through coax, out the pressure vessel, through the aircraft nacelle, and launches it directly into the skin of the aircraft. Efficiency of the